Open your Bibles with me to Exodus chapter 22. Exodus chapter 22. Tonight we're looking at verses 20 through 27 in a sermon entitled, Caring for One Another. Exodus chapter 22. Tonight we look at verses 20 through 27. You know, as I grew up in Meridian and as I traveled further south and as I came to Brooklyn, I saw through just a short number of years, uh, well, my years are short and few, uh, that neighborliness, hospitality, just genuine Southern hospitality kindness has changed. I, I, don't, I don't know. You know, when you go to a big city like New York City, to London, to places like that, you expect when you pass people on, on the sidewalk, because you've heard it before that these people are this way, that you, you can say something to them and they're just going to keep moving like you, you've, you've, you've never said anything to them at all. When you smile at them walking on the road, they, they don't smile back. But, you know, I think as our culture has changed, even in the South, those things have changed, too. Um, even within the church, those types of things have changed, especially when as the church, you go out into the community around you and you say, I'm the pastor at the church down the road. You expect some to not welcome you in and to slam the door in your face, but you expect some to, to give you the, the pastorly welcome because that's what you do in the South. And that's just not, not the way it happens anymore. People more and more when you know, we got the we got the southern wave, and as a school bus driver, I love I love that southern wave as you drive, where you 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 have to wave at every car that passes by. Um, us bus drivers, we have a, a very special wave. We're much more enthusiastic as we pass each other, especially when the children are no longer on because we've just unloaded. That's a really exciting time. Uh, but you know, you're you're supposed to wave at people. I didn't I didn't know this. I growing up in 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 the city in Meridian, you know, people didn't wave at each other because there was there was too many cars passing. But when you're on the rural road, Roads, when you're on the Carnes Road of Mississippi, you know, you've got to wave at the car that's passing by. Even, even those types of things are changing, especially more as you get into Walmart. How many people are having conversations in Walmart? I know you're having family reunions in Walmart, but I'm talking about with the stranger who's passing you up and down the aisles. And I, we try to in, engage in that type of thing. The other, the other day, uh, we, were, we were looking for uh, some seasonings on the seasoning aisle, the worst aisle in Walmart. And there's a, a lady next to me who's also looking for seasonings. So you know what I'm going to do. What are you looking for? And I'll tell you what I'm looking for. And together we can conquer this one, one, one with another. Let's both look for each other. See, that's a, just a neighborly thing. It's just a generous thing to do. And it's strange now to talk to people. It's strange now to talk to your cashier. It's strange because our culture is changing. And it's not always the case. Thankfully, I think we're a relic of this generosity here in the South. But in a lot of places, that's a, that's a weird thing to do. And I think it's happening more and more often and getting more and more strange as times go on. And that's important because as we continue our look at the sundry laws, the various laws that God gives here in Exodus chapter 22, we come now to a set of laws that look at caring for one's neighbor. And this is interesting, and this is the reason why I split up the sundry laws. We would have been done with this text before Christmas had I put them all together, but it just didn't seem like our sexual deviancy conversation of last week went very well with uh, the conversation of caring for one another this week. So, so we split them up, but it's all part of the same law code of Moses that there are various laws here that are given. And all of those various laws, some have to tackle some kind of aggressive and explicit content, while this one is much more neighborly in focus. So now that we have children in the room with us tonight, it's a, it's a great night to have children amongst us uh, compared to last week. But let's look together at Exodus chapter 22, verses 20 through 27, and see what God's word has to say about caring for one another. He who sacrifices to any God other than to the Lord alone shall be utterly destroyed. You, know, you shall not wrong a stranger or oppress him, for you were strangers in the land of Egypt. You shall not afflict any widow or orphan if you afflict him at all. And if he does cry out to me, I will surely hear his cry. And my anger will be kindled and I will kill you with a sword. And your wives shall become widows and your children fatherless. If you lend money to my people, to the poor among you, you are not to act as a creditor to him. You shall not charge him interest. 
If you ever take your neighbor's cloak as a pledge, you are to return it to him before the sun sets. For that is his only covering. It is his cloak for his body. What else shall he sleep in? And it shall come about that when he cries out to me, I will hear him, for I am gracious. Now, as we look at this theme of caring for one another, that first verse might be pretty shocking and might stand out as something that doesn't necessarily go with us with a theme of caring for one another. Our first verse here, verse 20, and God is pretty aggressive in this passage. Um, we, we definitely see the respect to be revered side of God, the to be feared side of God in these verses. And it, and it begins in verse 20. In a sermon and in a, a section that I'm entitling caring for one another, it begins this way. He who sacrifices to any God other than the Lord God alone shall be utterly destroyed. Strange start to caring for one another. What does that have to do with anything? I want to remind you because we're, we're looking forward to the summation of the law and what Jesus has to say on the matter. Jesus gives us the greatest commandments. And what does he say? He begins with love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, strength, and soul. And the second is like it, summed up maybe in my sermon title, care for one another, love your neighbor as yourself. These are the two greatest commandments. And so before we can even look at caring for one another, I, I think it's interesting that sandwiched right in between the, this, this caring for one another and looking at how we care for strangers and how we care for those who are nearest to us, before we can do any of those things, God says, first, you got to serve me alone. First, I have to be God alone. He is, in fact, if we're going to care for one another, he is our greatest one another. Who better should we care for than the one who created all things, who loved us enough to send his son to die for us, who carries me along day in and day out, who is present in all times and cares, as we looked this morning, intimately about the things that are going on in my own life. Certainly, if we're going to care for anybody, first it must begin with caring for God. And if we Understand verse 20, I think we can do that in a way that's pleasing to him. It begins here, he who sacrifices. One of the ways that we love God is through our worship to him. And in an Old Testament sense, this looks like sacrifice, certainly. But for us, the sacrifice that we would give to God, both monetarily and of time commitments and of all the things that we could sacrifice to him is a form of worship. We are sacrificing by being here tonight. We are sacrificing in when we pass the plate and give an offering unto his ministry. We are, we are sacrificing when we get out of our comfort zone and lift our voices and singing to him. We sacrifice in a number of ways, but it's important that we recognize if we care for one another, we first must care for God in such a way that we would give him the worship that is due his name. He who sacrifices, therefore, to any God other than to the Lord alone. His love, the way we care for God, is that we love him alone. He is above the rest. He is different. He is set apart from any other person that we would love. And I think this is difficult for us because of who God is and how he reveals himself to us, is that we cannot look upon God as we look upon a man. We cannot care for God in the same way that we would care for our spouse and that we would, we would serve them, we would take care of them, we would, we would make sure uh, that, that they, have, they, have, they have food, that they have uh, been treated well, and all of these things in the way that we would care for a child. We can't care for God in this same way. But the love that we do have for him should be set apart. It should be higher than all the rest. And I think this is a thing that we, we struggle in because of the nature of who God is. But the reality is, folks, this is what our entire life is, is focused around. Daily as Christians, if we're to love God rightly, we've got to say, before my spouse, before my children, before my neighbor, before my work, before my possessions, I need to love God alone. He is worthy of all of these things first and foremost. His love ought to be due to him and rendered to him in worship. It ought to be given to him alone. And then we have this very scary statement here at the end of verse 20. Because if you don't do what I just said, you shall be utterly destroyed. I don't know if you're, you're aware, but this is some strong language God's using here. 
the utterly destroyed language is language that's going to be incredibly important. And maybe this is something, if you, if you like to take notes, that you take note of in Joshua. The big problem in Joshua, it's not a problem, it's just it's a problem for our world, is God tells his people to go into the Canaanite land, and it's called the Canaanite conquest, and to utterly destroy them. And Joshua writes with such language that he, he, he talks up a big talk of Israel's army. And he talks of how they went into Jericho and just utterly destroyed them. He uses this type of language because it's war rhetoric. It's the rhetoric of a king who is, is, is coming through and decimating his enemies. It's the language of ancient Near Eastern kings who would say, Egypt is the best. You got to get, we use it today, right? The United States, there's no other country like the United States. We have the best army. There's, we, we have the most freedoms. We have this, we have that. We have the best, we have the best economy. We, have, we, we talk it up, a big talk. It doesn't necessarily have to have data there all the time in order to prove it. it we might sometimes say that this used to be the land of the free, and then in the next second we'll say it is the land of the free because it's that rhetoric of, 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 of freedom, of, of excitement of one's own country. And here, God is using a, a type of war rhetoric. He's saying, if you're going to love another God, get ready. Just like a king would decimate the army of his opponent, I will utterly destroy you. I will turn my face against you. You will be like unto my enemy before me. It's scary. That, that should render fear before us. And I always have to say, when the, the word respect is used, or when the word fear is used in reference to God, what my grandmother would always say. She used to hate how when you would talk about fearing the Lord, some pastors would say, oh, when you, when you fear the Lord, that doesn't necessarily mean that you're scared of him so much as you have reverence for him. Yes and no. He is a God to revere in reverence and respect for his house in an honoring type of way. But he's also a God to be feared. Because guess what, folks? He is a king with an angelic army who could decimate any foe that he wants to. But praise God, he is rich in mercy and grace and has not yet done that for us sinners. Praise God. Because he's one who should be feared. I'm going to do what John did when he saw Jesus. Revelation chapter 1, what happens with John? He falls flat on his face like a dead man. Um, I wonder if that's John way, John's way of saying, I passed out because Jesus was so scary that I shook myself almost to death and I woke up and I passed out again because there was Jesus with a sword coming out of his mouth. I mean, crazy stuff was happening for John. That's scary. His voice was like a waterfall. Uh, crazy stuff. He's scary. He's a God who should be feared. We should render respect, absolutely, but we should recognize he is a God to be feared. And when we love him rightly, we recognize his great power before us. We recognize when we care for God with a, a genuine fear and reverence and awe who he is. And this is important because loving God makes way for loving others. And this is a very controversial topic when it comes to our world, because, and especially when we, we get into the... Um, the sexual revolution that we, we talked about last week of, of these people who are homosexual and of, of all different types and, and breeds of, of what love is. And that's, that's their slogan, right? Is love is love. Well, here's the reality, folks, is that you cannot love apart from an understanding of a love as great as God's love. He is the true, authentic reality of what love is. We cannot conceive of what true love is outside of a God who loves us so much that even when we were deep in sin on a projection, on a, on a, on a, on a path to hell, that he would send his only son to die for us. That's love like no other. And if you can't comprehend that love, if you can't get behind that love, I'm sorry, it doesn't matter who you are. It doesn't matter if it's heterosexual or homosexual. It doesn't, it doesn't matter what love you're talking about. If you can't understand that love, then no, no other love is, is real for you. And, and to the person who would say that I love my spouse but says I hate God, no, you don't love your spouse. You have no idea what love is. True and authentic love can only be realized you can only care for another when you understand that you have been cared for in a way that is much better than anyone could ever care for you otherwise. 
Jesus has done the best job. It's his example that sets us up in a way that we can ever even imagine caring for another person. It's when I look at how Jesus has treated me that I realize how bad of a job I've done treating others. And it's at that moment that I can begin to make some some changes in my life. But the rest of the world, they don't have this. They They don't have this example. They don't have this basis. They don't have this thing to look to. They don't have this tangible, absolute, objective love that is Jesus. And so when the world says, well, I can, I can love somebody better by um, making sure that things are consensual. I, I can love somebody better by, by, by making sure they have gifts and they have money. I can, I can love somebody better by name all the things that the world does to treat others better. Guess what, folks? Every good work that they do is but filthy rags before the Lord, for they don't recognize the objective and absolute reality of what love is in Christ. If we're going to care for others, we have to first love God. That's why God, when he gives the greatest commandments, he doesn't go and say, when asked of what is the best thing that I should do in order to get to heaven, Lord, he doesn't say, well, we'll go open the door for, for, for somebody at, at the convenience store. Well, go and give all your money to the poor. Well, go. He doesn't say a lot of things to do. You know why? He first says, love the Lord your God, and then go and love your neighbor. Then go and do all the stuff. But you first, the first greatest commandment, in order to care for others, I've got to love God first. But God does not stop here in his understanding and his giving of the law for us. But he uses this as a jumping off point now for verses 21 through 27 to give us some real and tangible applications applicable ways in which we can love others and care for others. It's interesting. He starts with a love that is the realest of all, a love for God. And then he jumps to what in our human terms we would think is the opposite end of things. He jumps to loving strangers next. Caring for strangers is what we see in Exodus chapter 22, verses 21 through 24. I have a uh, a quote that I like from uh, Martin Luther. Um, Anthony gives me a, a calendar every pastor's appreciation from a, a, car, a, a Christian cartoon site, believe it or not, uh, that we both enjoy called Ref Tunes, R-E-F, like the Reformation. And it uses a lot of quotes from uh, people during the Reformation that this is really quotable material. And he's, he's a cartoonist and he like puts the cartoons to the, uh, to the quote. And this one's from Martin Luther. It says, the Christian is supposed to love his neighbor. And since his wife is his nearest neighbor, she should be his deepest love. And I love the cartoon. It's Martin Luther skipping down the road with his wife. And there's hearts over him. And hey, here's his wife, his closest neighbor. This is who he should love. Yet on the flip side of that, okay, if wife is closest, if if we spend every, every day with our dearest, well, what of the stranger? If it's if it should be easy and our deepest love should be towards our wife, our spouse. How much more difficult is it then to love that person who might even be faceless, who we might not even know their name, who we might see one time and never even interact with, just passing on the street and never see again? How do I love that person and how difficult is it? I think, you know, when we look at our our TV screen and there is no shortage of tragedy in our world. It's so, there's so much suffering in our world, and it's so well reported to us that we hear of a new war almost every day, it seems like. Or or, or the update is just another casualty count. Or the maltreatment of someone in a a foreign country. It's difficult to wrap your mind around. You know, who lays awake at night and, and wonders about some war in some country that you didn't even know existed and the people who are being harmed in it. I don't think that bothers us to the extent it should because there's no face with it. You understand what I'm saying? That there's so much tragedy, but it's not personal in any way. It seems like, it seems like fantasy. It seems like ba- versus the world that I currently live in, it just boggles my mind that there's some child out there who's going to go hungry tonight. 
It, it boggles my mind to think that maybe right now a missile just went through someone's apartment complex and they have nowhere to stay and they barely made it out alive and maybe not with all their limbs. Like that's mind boggling. Like we might get teary eyed right now and say, Ooh, that is hard to think about, but guess what? It's easy to push down and not think about anymore because, well, that's kind of made up. Uh, Do those people really exist? What are their names? What do they do? I'll never meet them. It's separated from reality in a lot of ways. Now, now bear with me here. Here's my, here's my way of, of proving this. It's easy to not love the stranger because we can forget about them. But that's why the children in Africa commercials were so, so successful. You know why? Because they showed you the child who was hungry. That's why this is the one that I hated the most. My mom made me mute the TV and even turn the channel when this one came on. In the arms of an angel. The, 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 the video with the dogs, this homeless dog will go hungry tonight. And if you caught it at the right time of night, you could watch that commercial for the next 35 minutes about these homeless, hungry, mangy, flea-bitten dogs, and you'd be crying by the end of it. You would have 17 dogs and you would be you would be funding 82 more if you continued to watch that. Why? Because that brings tears to your eyes because you can see the puppy dog. When you know it, when it's personal, when it's close, it gets a little bit realer. And so here's the issue. It's hard to love the stranger. Why? Because they're unknown to us. Because it's easier and our culture has conditioned us to say, nope, that, that, that doesn't matter. When it comes to strangers, it's difficult to love those who you don't know. But here's what God says. Of strangers who we might not know, of strangers who we may never know their name, it's important that we make a concentrated effort to love them well. Here's what God says, verse 21. You shall not wrong a stranger or oppress him for you were strangers in the land of Egypt. Love the stranger. Why? Because you were one. Now, that's very real for people who were once in slavery in Egypt, who were foreigners, that's the meaning of the word stranger used in this context in verse 21, sojourners, foreigners in the land of Egypt. That that, that hits home for them because they know what it was like to be in a land that was not their own. They know what it was like to be oppressed. They know what it was like to be a slave. But the same thing can be true for us as well. Not to that extent, but are we not all strangers to someone? Do we not all want to be treated well by strangers? (laughs) Do we not want to be treated well when we go to the uh, stranger who is going to sell us our next car? Do we not want to be treated well by the stranger who's going to sell us the house? Do we not want to be treated well by the stranger who might be up the corporate ladder who picks my name out of a bunch of names in order that I might be promoted? Do we not want to be a stranger when it be treated well as a stranger when it matters? So too, I think we want to be treated well as a stranger in every case. So too, you shall not wrong a stranger or oppress him, for you were once strangers yourself. And so I think it's important that especially in those instances when we look down at those people who are in a place where we once were, that we recognize the truth of verse 21. I might have trouble understanding some of the choices that they're making. I might have trouble understanding who they are because they're they're completely unknown to me, but I care for this person because I can see where I once either was there or could have easily been there. I think many times it's it's the homeless person. It's difficult because we have a lot of preconceived notions on that type of person. But I wonder, have any of you ever been in a position where it, it, it could have been a, a whole different way? You know, I think it's Dave Ramsey. He says like 85% of Americans are living paycheck to paycheck and could not last two, are two weeks from homelessness. It hits home when you realize that if things are not set up exactly right, that things could fall out right from under us and we could be that person. It doesn't matter if we've been there or not. The reality is we could be. Wouldn't we want to be treated well in a situation like that? And so treat others this way. 
And in fact, of the least amongst us, verse 22 has something to say. In Israelite society, the widow and the orphan were those with the least amount of power, as well as those who were the social outcasts and those who were at the end of the totem pole in their society. This is what God has to say about them. Verse 22, you shall not afflict any orphan or widow. In fact, in James chapter 1, verse 27, James has this to say about caring for orphans and widows. True and undefiled religion before God the Father is this, that you would care for orphans and widows in their time of need. God sees orphans and widows, even though they might be at the lowest part of the social rung in the culture of Israelite and Greco-Roman culture, and he says, but if you will care for these, that is pure and undefiled religion. That's the true religion before God the Father. He looks at that as a thing of great worship. Care for those who are least among you. For why? Verse 23. If you afflict him at all, that is, if you don't abide by verse 21 and 22, if you don't care well for those who I care for, and if he does cry out to me, I will surely hear his cry. God says, I will take vengeance on behalf of those who have been wronged. Genesis chapter 16, we've already read it before, but you can jot it down to read later. In Genesis chapter 16, Abram has taken it upon himself to make sure the promise is fulfilled. Sarah cannot have children. They have tried and failed. God comes to Abram and he says, look, God, Eliezer of Damascus is about to be the heir of my household. What, are you going to give me a child or not? God promises and doubles down on that promise that he surely is. And then the very next chapter, chapter 16, Genesis 16, Sarah comes to uh, Abram and says, all right, here's Hagar, my maidservant. Go ahead and have a child with her. And at the end of all of that, Hagar and Sarah have some type of womanly dispute in which they're cutting their eyes at each other and they can't live under the same roof anymore. And then she turns and says, you've got to get this maidservant out of here. I've had it with her. And Abram says, okay, do what you want with her. And they kick her out on the street. And there's a word used there in Genesis chapter 16 of how she severely treats Hagar. And it's kind of up to interpretation as to what the extent of that was. But there was maltreatment on behalf of Hagar. Guess what? The stranger, the sojourner, the foreigner is kicked out. And running through the desert, God appears by an angel and speaks to her. He listens in her time of need. Here is a story from the Old Testament that shows when the foreigner, when the sojourner, when the, when the person who is, is, is the least on the, on the cultural totem pole is found being maltreated, God is there with them, and he's ready to take vengeance. And he actually pours out his blessing upon Hagar and her offspring, Ishmael. God punishes those who mistreat. In fact, verse 24, it heightens and intensifies this. And my anger will be kindled. This is reminiscent of verse, the end of verse 20 here. And I will kill you with the sword. Lord have mercy. And your wives shall become widows and your children fatherless. Okay, there's your war rhetoric again. How's God feel about the mistreatment of those who are strangers amongst us? He doubles down. He turns it around and he says, your wife will be widowed. And your children will be without a father if you treat people this way. Well, that is, is that what God's really saying will happen? Okay, well, I'm not going to say he ain't because we already talked about fearing him, haven't we? But I think the point here that God's trying to make is I take it very seriously. You might make yourself an enemy to me by not loving me, but I want you to know you're going to make yourself an enemy of me and maybe even more so an enemy of me if you mistreat those who you don't even know. God cares how we treat strangers. And so church, I think it's important for the people of God that we be known by the way that we treat others, specifically the way we treat those who we don't even know. Just a few hours ago, our youth handbell choir and some others from our church went to, um, because this is recorded, I'm going to leave out names, to a, um, a person's house in our community and a person who's a part of our church um, in order that they might play, for, play the handbells for someone who is on hospice and also um, is, is a shut-in in our community. 
many I would I would venture to say uh 95% of our youth do not do not even know who she is. Some of the adults who went with us, I would venture to say, have probably never ha- held a conversation with her before. But out of the love and generosity of their heart, they went and they played for her and took time out of youth, folks, youth, teenagers, took time to love those who they don't even know. How many times also, we could, we could go around the room, we could, we could share the stories of how as Christians, we have stepped up to those who we don't even know and we have poured out love and generosity to them. How we've, we've gone above and beyond to love those who we have no idea who they even are. That is characteristic of Christianity. That is something that the rest of the world cannot do. And even if they attempt to do it, let's go back to our first point. If they don't have the love of God within them and they don't know who God is, they truly cannot love and minister like we can. We have something that no one else has. It's a Holy Spirit within us that moves us to love those who we don't even know, who are the furthest from us. Why? Because we were once far from God ourselves. And this leads us to love others in an explosive and outrageous and a generous type of way. If you'll flip with me just for a moment to 1 Peter chapter 2, just as Exodus tells us that you were once slaves in Egypt, 1 Peter says it a different way for those of us who are under Christ's lordship. 1 1 Peter chapter 2, 1 Peter chapter 2, I'm going to look at verses 9 and 10. 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 9 and 10. Peter has this to say, reminding us of how we ought to treat those around us, for we once were in their, in their shoes. 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 9. Here he is quoting uh, from a bunch of different um, Old Testament texts as well. But you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for God's own possession, so that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who has called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Paul's there. Keep it there, though, because I'm looking at verse 10 next. He's looking at believers, and he's saying, hey, check out what your identity is. You are royal to God. You are holy to God. God has established you as a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession. This is who you are, but this isn't always who you've been. Verse 10. For you once were not a people, but now you are the people of God. You had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. Let that be our mindset. That how how big of a sinner once was I? How far from God once was I? How big of a stranger to God was I that he called out my name and I didn't even respond to him for so long? But praise God that now I am a chosen people. I'm a possession for God. I'm I'm in his kingdom. I'm, I'm his royal priesthood. I am somebody in the kingdom of God. It wasn't always this way. And maybe the person I'm looking at right now, as strange as they might be to me, as, as foreign as they might be to me, as completely unknown to me as they are, they might be where I once was. Let me treat them with the respect and honor and dignity and love that God once gave to me. That's how we treat the stranger. But then in verses 25 through 27, God now turns it. He's, he's looked at loving God. He's looked at loving those who are the furthest from us. And now he kind of brings it back into the middle here. And he says, now let's look at how we would care for those who are near to us, who maybe we do have some type of relationship with. Maybe they're neighbors. Maybe they're family. Maybe they're just people who are a part here of the nation of Israel. Maybe in our situation, who are a part of, of the church, who are a part of this gathering. We are to care for those who are like us and known by us. Look at verse 25. Here he gives specific examples of how we can do that. If you lend money to my people, to the poor among you, you are not to act as a creditor to him. You shall not charge him interest. Here, in the Jewish kingdom that God is setting up here and giving a law as a foundation for, He tells the people that if you were to lend to someone, that you're not to charge them interest. 
Now, it, I don't know that necessarily this is something that is is a, is a hundred percent. You know, if if we're in the if we're in the lending business, you know, is is God speaking to me here? We have to take into account that He is talking to the Jewish kingdom here. However, I think there is a one hundred percent application that we find not in the kingdom of Israel, but in the kingdom of Christ. If you'll flip with me, and we're gonna we're gonna flip just a handful more times here to Acts chapter two. If we want to see what the New Testament example is of living out the laws of community of God's people, it comes in the church. And so if we take the national laws of, of, uh, of Israel and want to apply those, we need to apply them specifically to God's kingdom here and now, and that is through the establishment of the church. Acts chapter 2 tells us of the day of Pentecost, the birthing of the church. It is on this day of Pentecost that the church it grows exponentially very quickly. And in verses 41 through 47, we see something like unto the creditor lender example given as you see on the screen. Acts chapter 2, verse 41, it recounts for us the historical um, event here of the beginning of the church. Acts 2.41, so then those who had received his word were baptized, and that day there were added about 3,000 souls. They were continually devoting themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship and to the breaking of bread and to prayer. And so we have a lot of people coming in, but a lot of people who are still devoted. Uh, it's not like they're, they're just here today, gone tomorrow. They're devoted to each other, and in fact, even devoted to each other in fellowship. Verse 43, Everybody kept feeling a sense of awe. Many wonders and signs were taking place through the apostles. Here it is, verse 44. And all those who had believed were together and had all things in common. How much so, verse 45, that they began selling their property and possessions and were sharing them with all as anyone might have need. So the early church is very much likened to this verse here not necessarily of a lender and a creditor, but jumping even far beyond that to say, you have no need to ask me for a loan. I have no need to ask that it would even come back to me, but that I would give to you and I would give to you abundantly. Why? Because we are all communitively, we are all collectively the body of believers, and I want to serve you as Christ has served me, that he would give his all upon the cross, and I would give whatever I can to serve you as someone who is loved by God. Another way that we can look at this is in our own church, is our Benevolence Committee. That committee exists in order, not that we would say, okay, we're going to give you this money, but you got to pay the church back. In fact, we as a benevolence committee oftentimes attempt to do one thing, to pay whatever bill is asked of us, to, to send whatever money is asked of us, to, to help with, with supplies and groceries and all these things that are asked of us on, here's what we need to do though. We're going to invite you to church. We're going to tell you that God loves you. We're going to tell you all, all of these things as part of the caveat of this. But guess what? These people don't have to come to church. That's not part, of, it's not a contract in that way. Freely given. They, they don't have to come and, 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 and sit for six services and then they feel like they've paid God back. That's not how it works. We make sure that they recognize. There's no credit on your account. There, there, there's nothing that you have to pay back. This is not a loan in any way. The church is to freely give. And I wonder, church, how we can live this out. You know, when we look at Acts chapter 2 and we see a church that is just all in and, and loving one another and communing with one another, it's something that we should strive for. It's the example of how the church ought to be. There are people amongst us who are in need, maybe in financial need, maybe in need of, of, of food and clothing and shelter, maybe in need of, because of their isolation, that they, they need someone to talk to and fellowship with. Maybe that's why they're here. And I think often we're not sensitive to those things. But worse than that, I think often there's people amongst us who, because of their pride, they say, well, I can't ask that that person who knows how to, 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 to do maintenance on my home, if, if they would be so inclined to come out and help me, and that I'd be willing to learn, but I, I don't know that I could put myself out there and, and really ask them of their time. Church says, what the church is for is that we would come together. People with different skill sets 
though they might not use their gifts on stage, though they might not use their gifts in the building of the church, have been gifted a skill set by God that they might give that to you as part of the church. You need to ask for it. That doesn't mean you become somebody who always has their hand out. That's not what I'm saying here. But what I am saying is there's people who, because of their pride, do not let the church fulfill their needs. Let the church serve you. Let the church care for you. That's what we're called to do. And how many times, I'll tell you how many times, how many times do I go and I, I, I call someone or I go and visit someone and I say, look, I know you're in a bond right now. How can I help you? And yes, they're always going to say, well, you can pray for me. I would love to do that because my skill set is such that I can pray for you. But oftentimes there's many other things that the church can do and, and, and they're, they're willing to, to sit and, and to suffer rather than to let the church bless them and to be blessed in blessing them. Let's, let's do that, church. And I, I'm speaking in a room full of doers, but one day we might be the needers. That's the way it all works. Ask. It is a better blessing to give than it is to receive. Let's live that out in caring for others. In verse 26 through 27, he continues this theme of loans, and he says this, If you ever take your neighbor's cloak as a pledge, you are to return it to him before the sun sets. It's his only covering. It is his cloak for his body. What else shall he sleep in? I uh, recently was doing the, doing the scroll through the Facebook, and I saw this, uh, this video. It was this little, uh, little Asian man in a, in a nail salon that was, you know, he's, he's the nail guy and uh, yeah, Jenny, Jenny's laughing. She knows him. Um, you know, he, and he's, he's done this girl's nails and great grandma has now come into the store because he, he took her, the girl's shoes and would not give them back to her. And she's like, um, I, why do you have her shoes? Why won't you give them back? She had walked out and had not paid for the service had walked out and tried to, to, to take her free nails, I guess. Well, she had, she had forgotten that she had to take them expensive shoes off in order to get them toes done. And so he slick stole the shoes in order that, hey, this is the pledge. You're, you're going to come back for these. And that girl sent in mama, grandma, and then finally, this was the fourth attempt, great grandma had to squash the situation. And he was standing still. You're not getting your shoes until you pay it back. And it's a hilarious story. I mean, I can only imagine what this would be like. I can only imagine, Priscilla, what would have happened if, you know, like, not only did you send great grandma, and I want to know what happened. Like, how did he steal the shoes? Like, did he tackle her at the door and take them off? Like, it, but it's a pledge that she's going to come back and she's going to give what is due. God's people, however, <laughs> are not called to steal shoes are not called to hold pledges, are not called to, to go and to ask of the one who has stolen from us that we might receive it again. For this is what God says in verse 27. And it shall come about that when he cries out to me, I will hear him, for I am gracious. Now, he's not as um, serious here with with the language as we have in verse 20 and as in verse uh, 24, but certainly the same thing is understood here. God is going to get angry when we go and ap apply this pledge to someone we know. Instead of going after the person who has wronged us, here's, here's what it says, here's what it's meant. God's people should be known for their thoughtfulness towards another situation and less by their ability to stand for their own justice. Let God stand for your justice. Where do I get that from? Matthew chapter 5, what does Jesus say? Turn the other cheek. If someone demands of you to go a mile, take them too. I've told the story before. I was in the Burger King drive-thru. I was 17 years old in Meridian, Mississippi. It was on the bad side of town. It, it was on the bad side of town. And this guy caught me on the other side of Burger King drive through and the Lord was working in my life right then on Matthew chapter 5. Now, I do not advise this in any type of way, but the Lord was working on me, and the Spirit was moving, and I saw I had the protection of the Lord. This man knocks on my window. You don't roll the window down, but I rolled the window down, and he said, hey, can you take me over here to my friend's house? And in the back of my mind, I just read it, Matthew chapter 5. If someone demands of you to go one mile, go with them too. Now, you might want to be packing on both of those miles, and I was not. Ricky can tell you I was not. 
But I said, sure, come on. And I, I don't remember the extent of the gospel conversation that I had with him because I was scared. And I took him to some places that looked kind of sketchy. But at the end of the day, the Holy Spirit had led me to do this thing. Why? Because I wasn't worried about my own justice, my own pers- preservation, my own anything. I was worried about this person who had asked of me, and I was going to love him in an outrageously kind type of way for Jesus. That's to be commended, sure, and also to, not to be. And you don't have to go that radical, but my point is to say, how are we loving those around us? God's people ought to be more known for their thoughtfulness towards others than for what they can get from the situation. In closing, I want to look, and this will be it here, at John chapter 13. Because this really is, is the summation of it all, and better yet, it's on the mouth of Jesus. John chapter 13, we'll look at verses 34 through 35, and this will be where we close tonight. John chapter 13, verses 34 and 35. We're to care for our Lord, and by doing so, we can care for others. We're to care both for the stranger and for those closest to us. We should be known for how we care and love for others. John chapter 13, beginning in verse 34. Jesus says this, A new commandment I give to you, that you love one another, even as I have loved you, that you also might love one another. Jesus here calls us to a radical type of love, a love that's even as he has loved us. That means, folks, that we would love another, one who is nearest to us, and even the stranger with a radical love that would die on a cross, a cross that is not deserved for somebody else. Jesus says this before he goes to Calvary, but we know as a church who reads it post-Calvary, what Jesus really means. And this is what he says in verse 35. If you'll do this by this, all men will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for the love that you've shown us, that you would die on the cross for us. We thank you for Jesus and the example he's given us. Lord, as we go out into another week in the world around us, I pray that you would give us the ability to be radical Christians who would love those around us who are well-known to us with a generous, hospitable, and forgiving love. But also, Lord, I, I ask that you would, in this challenge of loving the stranger, help us to love those who we don't even know as children of God who are loved by you. Lord, I pray that as we attempt to do this, that you would stand close to us and that your presence might always be near to us as we seek to first love you as you have loved us. Lord, we thank you and we ask that as we leave from here that you'd give us safety, that you'd bring us back together on Wednesday and Sunday as we gather as your people. We thank you for what you're doing in our church and in our lives. Continue to give us the testimony of those who have been changed by God and the witness of the miraculous things you're doing even before our very eyes and in our presence. Lord, we thank you for all of these things. It's in the name of Jesus we ask them. Amen.